What we need to see, I believe, when it comes to the challenge of wokeness, I'll sometimes be asked when I speak on this, what is the plan though? What is the program? Where does this go for us? How are we supposed to, how are we supposed to handle these issues? Because the other side has this whole set of priorities and, and, and policies they want to put into place. What do you want to do? What are you saying is our, uh, is our way forward? And I believe that we find our way forward, honestly, in Scripture. I don't think that this is fideism or a kind of uh, unprincipled pietism or something like this. I think this is simply living according to sola scriptura and especially putting into work the doctrine of the total sufficiency of the Bible. The Bible, of course, is our sufficient book, the sufficient book. But men... Here's what I want you to hear very quickly before we dive in. I want you to understand that I think today the doctrine that is most attacked and most challenged, both at the level of ideas and at the level of practice, is the doctrine of scriptural sufficiency. There's a good number of people who say, yeah, I'm under the authority of the Bible, but I, I'm not necessarily relying upon scripture for all my thinking in that area. There's a lot to say about that conversation. We've already been talking about it to some degree this week, but I want you just to understand that at least in my classroom, in my class, we are operating according to the total sufficiency of Scripture. It doesn't mean that we don't read unchristian sources. It doesn't mean that we're never going to find contact points with the truth in non-Christian sources. We've talked about that at some length. It does mean, though, that we understand, as I have been at pains to say this week, that the Christian system is the true system and no other system is true. Sometimes we talk about the exclusivity of the gospel or the exclusivity of Christ, and we must talk about that. What We actually have to go beyond that, don't we? We have to go beyond that and talk about the exclusivity of the Christian worldview, the exclusivity of Christian doctrine. Are you shored up there? Do you confess that easily and readily? You should, because that's only the logical implication <laughs> of the exclusivity of Christ. If Christ is the exclusive way to God, then knowing Christ is the only way to know God. And so knowing Christ is true knowledge of God and brings you into the Narnian wonder of the God-made world that you can only fully understand through redeemed eyes and a redeemed heart. You will only comprehend the beauty and glory and joyfulness of the world when you know God. When you know God, you are using your brain for what it was made to be used for. But you're not only using your brain. Your, your heart and your mind are working together in perfect harmony. or Not, not in perfect harmony, but in, in, in symbiotic harmony, we should say, really. In order that you would worship the Lord with your mind and with your heart. And so that, that is all to say that as Christians, we don't just have an exclusive gospel. Oh, by the way, Jesus is the only way to God. i got to throw that in just so you understand. He's the only name you can claim in order to be saved. It's not just that. It's that he's the doorway, isn't he? You, you open the wardrobe into Narnia, and this is exclusively the Christian worldview in all its beauty and glory, and you're the only one who can know it. The unbeliever does not know the Christian worldview. They do not believe Christian doctrine, and so they, they do not know the exclusive truth about all God's world. Now, there are certain, certain truths they can understand. We, we've talked about this from natural theology, but I simply want you to understand that you must remember that in bringing people into Christian doctrine and Christian worldview, we're not simply calling them to, to pick our team to root for, for our, our squad, we are saying this and this alone is the exclusive knowledge of God. This is the worldview that alone explains all things without exception. All things without exception. This is the way to know truly, but not just know in the intellectual sense, know in the fullest possible sense. Know with fullness of, of mind committed to it. Know with fullness of heart drawn to it. We are walking in a world of aesthetic wonder, all driven by divine truth. And so this means that I, I think if you reframe people's expectations a little bit, they're better queued up to receive Christian truth because they're not just claiming 
an exclusive but, but narrow way to salvation in this narrow issue of Christian doctrine, they understand that they alone among all the world know exclusively the truth of God and others do not. They know fragments of the truth. They know parts of the truth. They see reality as God has made it. So there are, there are those contact points, but they can't know it comprehensively. And they certainly can't know it without faith in Jesus Christ. So all that is a bit of a, again, a reframing of sufficiency such that we don't start, we don't start from this standpoint that everybody knows all sorts of truth and then Christians say, oh, but we've got to kind of stop the presses and work it around and then stop listening to other people. No, we start from the standpoint that we and we alone, because of God's grace, know truth. We know absolute truth. We know objective truth. We see the world rightly. (laughs) Not because we're intelligent. This is not Thomistic philosophy. Not because... uh, we have greater reasoning capacities than the unbeliever in and of ourselves, but because we are redeemed. And to know the exclusive gospel is to know the Christian worldview. And thus, within the Christian worldview, you wander all through Narnia making these beautiful discoveries of of truth. And one of those truths that you discover is that as Ephesians 2, 11 to 18 makes clear, God has solved the problem of partiality and hostility between people groups. The New Testament does not know our precise category of race, but it definitely knows alienation between peoples who have long-standing grievances, who have bitter conflicts in their past, let me speak less politely, who hate one another in their background, who have done, in some cases, terrible things to one another. The Bible knows this. The Bible is not surprised by these problems in our world. It's sufficient for these things. Look with me at Ephesians 2.11, please. Turn there this morning as we begin. We'll break this down into two sections, a short section here and then a longer section in just a moment, and then we'll head into technology after I take any final questions in the area of wokeness. Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So the Apostle Paul here identifies what? Off the bat, stark division. He's speaking to uh, Gentile Christians, and he says that they are separated from Christ, alienated from Israel, strangers to the grace of God. That's how they start. That's how he begins uh, this section on what the gospel does for the people of God. They were the uncircumcision. So there is a covenantal distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. They are separated from Christ, alienated from Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, and all this means that they have no hope and they are without God in the world. Well, that's a fairly strong depiction of the natural man's condition, is it not? There is absolutely no hope in our natural state. And in this natural state, we we naturally draw lines between one another. John Stott has said this along these lines in commenting on this passage. Men still build walls of partition and division like the terrible Berlin Wall, or erect invisible curtains of iron or bamboo, or construct barriers of race, color, caste, tribe, or class. Divisiveness is a constant characteristic of every community without Christ. Does that sound familiar? This is our world right now. Some of you are observing political chaos and controversy right now. There's much to say about that. We're not even going to try to scratch the surface of that. But suffice it to say that humanity is very good at dividing. Humanity is very good at separating from one another. The Jews and Gentiles are separated from a God-given institution. Primarily, circumcision is what Paul identifies here. It it actually marks out physically uh, supposedly God-fearing people from the Gentiles. But those divisions persist and multiply, not simply between Jews and Gentiles, but between humanity, people of all kinds. 
So in our natural state, being without God, we're not all in a kumbaya circle, holding hands, dwelling together in unity and harmony, are we? No, we are naturally alienated from God vertically and alienated from one another horizontally. That is the natural condition of man. We are alienated from God vertically. That's our first and, and biggest problem, of course. And the problem that flows out of it is that we are alienated from one another horizontally in the world that God has made. People who do not have Jesus Christ, just refresh yourself and remember this, have no hope and are without God in the world. This is a stark picture of fallen humanity, and it reminds us, okay, fallen humanity can make gains, let's say, in terms of justice, progress, societal uplift. We want to affirm that. Some societies are better than others. We're not cultural relativists in here, okay? Other campuses are. We're not teaching. I'm not teaching cultural and societal relativism. You can't as a Christian. But we need to just remember there's ultimately no hope in this world. There's no hope in this world. There's no hope outside of God. We're glad when people around us, our neighbors around us, in a political sense, do choose roughly what is virtuous over what is not virtuous. We, we want unbelievers to make that choice. We don't, we don't want unbelievers to abort their children, for example, do we? We're not indifferent to that as believers. We want less death and suffering in general uh, if we can have it in civilizational and societal terms. And, and we're even called to be salt and light, as I've said a few times in the class already, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. We're called to be salt and light, which I think has a lot of different ramifications. There's a lot to say about that. But we just also must remember there isn't any hope here in this world. Those who have God, well, look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2.12. They have no hope. They're without God. So when you're looking at any time, for example, at fallen society's secular context, just remember, there's not ultimately going to be a utopian seed that comes to full flowering. It may look that way. Societies may make progress for a time, but ultimately they are not. They are not the true people of God, and they cannot ultimately bring the promises of God to full fruition. No human society can. It won't happen. There is alienation, division, hostility in the world. That's what other texts of Scripture say as well. We hate God and we hate one another. That's another New Testament reality. We hate God and we hate one another. Well, that's pretty simple. That tells us why people divide from one another. It's not just an America. It's not just America's heritage. It's not just the American pedigree with regard to slavery and Jim Crow and other racist realities we can talk about. It's true of every society. It's true of every context. The American slave system exists because of African slave traders who enslave uh, fellow Africans and send them across the Atlantic for a profit. There's all sorts of slave systems all around the world. There's genocides that play out between Japan and China, to talk, to talk about one other example. There's genocide of various kinds throughout the European context. There's hideous things that happen in Russia, in Cambodia, under Chairman Mao in China. We can go on and on. People do terrible things to one another. America is not the only place that has struggled and seen sin really creep into its body politic. All, this, this is the norm. This is the norm. This is what happens when you get people together in mass groupings who hate God and hate one another in their natural state. We shouldn't expect differently. And that's why it is so important that we not think that there is an ultimate solution in this world. Verse 13 to 18 gives us the hope we need. And it gives us what the church needs to preach in a context like ours, divided by wokeness and other ideologies in the 21st century, but not just now, going forward. For as long as you live, you have what you need to, to take into societies, into countries, into people groups, into communities. It's this. 
Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Whew. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. In their natural state, the Gentiles, Paul says here, are far off from God. But through faith in Jesus Christ, they may draw near to God. How, how do they draw near? How have they been brought near? Note that. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually a perfect passive. Have been brought near. It's not something we have done. We haven't brought ourselves near, deposited ourselves just shy of the cross in order that God would smile upon us in our free will, see that we have had it, and then grant us salvation. Us doing our part, God doing his part. No. Instead, those who are far off, the Gentiles, have been brought near, but, but not in a directional sense. In a spiritual sense, by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is that which can bring the only solution to alienation, division, and intense hostility as predominates and proliferates in the world of men. The blood of Christ is the solution humanity needs for our alienation, estrangement, anger, hatred, and hopelessness. People are hopeless around us. Suicide rates have risen sharply in recent months. That's just the latest manifestation of hopelessness, though. Hopelessness has been a thing and is going to be a thing. Outside of God, you're hopeless. That's what Paul just said in our previous collection of verses. The Gentiles are without hope. What do you expect when a, a mass group of people, in some sense, transitions from some kind of religious traditionalism that at some level is interfacing with Christianity to a basically neo-pagan, as I have argued, and secular society, a strange blend of the two, really? What do you expect? People are hopeless. But the solution to hopelessness is not a pill, it's not a therapy session, it's not self-affirmation, it's not self-esteem, it's not a life coach, it's not better wellness, it's not meditation practices on an app. What is it? What is the solution? The only solution to these conditions of various kinds is the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ washes us clean, and He Himself, Jesus, the atoning sacrifice, the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement in perfect form, is our peace. Where is peace to be found? That is really one of the major questions of our time. Where will we find peace in this alienated, hostile world? It's very simple. This question has been definitively and decisively answered once and for all time. There is only peace in Jesus. It's not that he is an upgraded peace. It's not that he is a slightly better peace. It's not that he is an enhanced peace from what you can find in natural terms in this fallen world. It is that he is the exclusive peace. He is the only one who can bring peace between Jew and Gentile and overcome this covenantal alienation and separation. He has made us both one. He has done it. He has done it. He has accomplished it. He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of ekthron in the Greek. Hostility. 
bristling hatred of one people group for another. He has done it. So the need for peace that we all feel has been met by God. He has done what is needed to bring Jew and Gentile together in Ephesus in the context of the local church. Now, we're not trying to tie up every loose thread in the New Testament in eschatological terms. There's more to say about the people of God and the fate of the Jews and the ingathering of the Jews that I believe, and I'm guessing many of you believe, will happen later in days to come. We're not trying to tie that up and answer all those questions. Those will be answered for you at this school, I'm guessing, in, in other classes. So don't overread my comments here. Nonetheless, don't underread them either in terms of the Bible. There isn't, there isn't a Jewish church, from what Paul says, and a Gentile church, right? At the very least, we have no grounds to make that conclusion from Ephesians 2 and our doctrine of blood atonement, blood atonement for sin. No, the people who were alienated have had that wall, a wall of hostility, crash and burn, and it doesn't exist anymore between these peoples who have lived in ekthron, in hostility to one another. Look, Paul is identifying these conditions that sound <clears throat> very much like our conditions today. We are hearing that we have division that really cannot be overcome because it's long-standing, because it's grounded in American history, because it persists in different ways in our society and in our culture. But the sufficiency of Scripture summons us to see with fresh eyes that the dividing wall of hostility and every form of it is broken down in the church. That's what I want you to understand from our brief study this morning. Not to try to tie up every loose thread for days to come in terms of the people of God. There are hard questions and many texts to consider along those lines. But simply to see this basic atoning point that the blood of Christ is effectual and powerful. It doesn't make salvation possible. It makes salvation certain. The only reason you will be saved, the only reason any of us will be saved, is because the blood of Christ was shed for us. And it has not created conditions favorable to you getting yourself saved. You will be saved because of this effectual atonement. You were cleansed on the cross. You were not, in technical terms, justified at the cross. Your justification came the moment God gave you faith through the Holy Spirit in the atoning work of Jesus, when that was announced to you through the gospel. That is when you were justified by faith and faith alone. So we have to handle with care on these points, don't we? In technical theological terms, we're not teaching, I'm not teaching here, what's called eternal justification, Abraham Kuyper, for example, taught a form of that. I revere Kuyper in many respects, but I don't go with him there. Nonetheless, the grounds of our justification were secured at the cross, weren't they? Because the faith we exercise that is justifying is faith in Christ, recognizing that His blood cleansed us and purchased us and paid for our sin, the sin of the elect, the sin of the church at the cross. You weren't then justified in 33 AD, but you were, your salvation was purchased there. It was bought there. You were paid for there. Jesus went to the market, if you will, and he secured your salvation several thousand years before you and I exercised faith. He made us one in the church. There, there aren't Jewish churches and Gentile churches. There shouldn't be. There should not be churches for, for different ethnicities. There may be churches where there's a lot of one ethnicity, 
of course, but there shouldn't be a church that is exclusively for one ethnicity or one group. There shouldn't be a rich church. There shouldn't be an Instagram influencer's church. There shouldn't be an old people's church. There should only be churches filled with redeemed, blood-bought sinners of every kind. This text teaches us who we are. We are a Christian. We are a Christian. That's who we are. We're not a certain subset of Christian. Uh, There's not a modifier to attach to that term Christian. We are Christians by the blood of Jesus Christ. He did this in His flesh, verse 14. Note how important the incarnation, the humanity of Jesus Christ is for our redemption. He had to be God in order to save us. Only God can save. But He had to be human in order to die in our place. He had to take on flesh. And so He did. He is not a disembodied God who hovers far above us and zaps us with a lightning bolt in order to save us. He took on flesh in order to redeem us. And this means, verse 15, that the old covenant law is abolished. He abolished it. Other places, the New Testament will say that that law is fulfilled. In fact, there's something of an ongoing conversation between different New Testament authors in terms of the language they use over that precise point. One of the most important, one of the most interesting uh, exegetical and theological subjects, I think, in all of Christian theology. What exactly has happened with the law? Well, here, the Apostle Paul, we're just trying to represent him here, says that that law is abolished. The law that was expressed in ordinances, which I read as the Old Covenant law in sum, in toto, I don't believe that the Ten Commandments are still binding on us. I believe that all of this law has been brought to perfect fulfillment in Jesus Christ to the extent that it is, it is fully appropriate to say that it is abolished for the Christian. We're not under that administration. We're under the new covenant. It's not that the old covenant law is bad. It's not that it fails to teach us. It definitely teaches us. It definitely instructs us. It gives us the very character and will of Almighty God for His Old Covenant people. We learn a tremendous amount from it. The New Covenant law is based upon it. Nonetheless, we are not under the administration of Israel. And I do not believe in the tripartite distinction introduced by Aquinas and others, uh, most popularized in the Reformed tradition and Evangelical tradition by Calvin. I don't believe that the civil and ceremonial aspects of the law have come to fulfillment, but the moral aspects of the law still operate. I believe that the moral, civil, and ceremonial law, that's not a biblical breakdown, by the way, but I believe all the law has come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. There are different positions along those lines. Uh, I'm not laying down a gauntlet and saying that my precise view is the only one held and the only one that could be held. Uh, I think you can put together good arguments for different positions and let that be said. And I want to teach and work with others who, who might have slightly different formulations there. But that, that is my view based on texts like this. I think that that is what Paul is saying in saying that that law is abolished. And so there is not two men. There is, verse 15, created in himself, in Christ, and in Christ alone, one new man. One new man, such that all who are in Christ are one. We are saved. We are together Christians. Again, there aren't two men. There is one new man in terms of the church. Peace has been made. And what does Paul say in the next verse? We are reconciled to God in one body through the cross. All salvation runs through the cross. There are challenging questions that we tackle in terms of uh, the history of Israel and the future of Israel, these sorts of matters. But suffice it to say that there is no saved person outside of the cross, is there? The blood of Christ alone washes clean. All, All the scripture, in terms of the doctrine of atonement, points ahead to the cross. Isaiah 53 
Day of Atonement, sacrificial system, on and on it goes. All of it culminates in the cross. That is where, end of verse 16, hostility, there it is again. <laughs> this is a big issue, isn't it, in Ephesus? This is not a small matter. Hostility is what? Apoktenos, killed. It is killed. The cross murders hostility. Apostolic language sounds strange, even honestly in some conservative evangelical settings where we have these delicate sensibilities and we don't want to talk about blood atonement and we want to move away from that and we only want a positive framing of things and we don't want warrior language even though God, Exodus 15, 3, is a warrior and Jesus is a warrior king. We don't, want, we don't want that element of Jesus anymore because that doesn't play well with an iPhone-drenched society, smooth. We don't ever see animals killed. We don't want hunting. We don't want guns, these sorts of things. Well, go back to the language of New Testament authors and see what they say. They say that hostility has been murdered in its sleep. That's what the Bible teaches. There is no hostility that any more can exist between those who claim Christ as their Savior because hostility has been killed. It's been done away with. It's been destroyed. And I mean this in objective terms. Note how objective the atonement is. My next book is on the atonement, Lord willing, or my next book after the wokeness book, my next academic book, kind of like Reenchanting Humanity, of that length and that type. It's going to be called, Lord willing, Jesus the Warrior Savior. And so it's going to be, God allowing, a doctrine of atonement. Um, Jesus the Warrior Savior. And what I want to emphasize there is very simply what I think the New Testament emphasizes, the objective accomplishment of Christ on the cross. Salvation is not a subjective reality first and foremost. Salvation is not subjective first and foremost. Salvation is objective. It is grounded in the will and decree of God, and that decree is realized in terms of atonement fully and finally at the cross of Jesus Christ. That is God's objective answer to our predicaments, our problems, our, namely, sin. That is what God offers as His objective solution. Your salvation then, and the salvation of those you minister to, at least for those you perceive as best you can are Christians, is not a subjective-driven salvation. It's not a subjective Christianity then, is it? It's the opposite of so much spirituality today, which is so subjective. What, is it, what does it make me feel like? What is the service? How, do I like the service? How do I feel when the preacher talks? My feelings determine so much today in so many evangelical settings. Your tone is off. I don't like your tone. Maybe it's true objectively, but subjectively, I don't like it. It doesn't make me feel good. What, what is Christianity? Christianity is nothing other than an objective system. It's grounded in hard, concrete realities. We're not saved however we want to be saved. We're not saved in ways that make us feel good. We're saved through blood. We're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. How does that make you feel? Well, whatever your 21st century sensibilities are, it should make you feel overjoyed for the rest of your life. But even if your feelings dip and ebb and flow, and even if you go through valleys in life, and even if there are seasons of real challenge and trial, nothing objectively changes about the cross of Jesus Christ. All the facts 
of atonement, blood sacrifice for sin, assuaging the just, furious wrath of Almighty God. Stand. Wrath is your major problem because sin is your major problem. And wrath has been objectively dealt with by Christ. The Father hates sin. And the Father pours out His wrath on His Son as our substitute sacrifice. And that is doctrinal fuel for you to live in joy and gladness and strength and faith-driven triumph, not circumstantial triumph, but faith-driven triumph every day you live. Your greatest need is not a spouse or children or a great ministry position or money or any other earthly thing. Your greatest need is to not drink the cup of the Father's wrath. That is the need of every person. That cuts across every society. Every person of every skin color has that need. Every community, every neighborhood, every nation, every ethnos has that need. The need to not drink the Father's wrath for eternity. That is our, that is our dominant problem by a factor of infinity. Do you hear how strong I'm talking? <laughs> that is our dominant problem by a factor of infinity. Everything else that we face in this world pales in comparison to that reality that we deserve to drink the cup of the Father's wrath, but we won't because of Christ. That is such a glorious reality, in fact, that it objectively overcomes the hostility between God and man vertically, and then secondarily it's so strong that it overcomes hostility between man and man. Listen to me. If the cross can overcome the hostility between a, a holy God, a perfectly holy God, who is justly wrathful against sin, can the cross not overcome hostility between peoples of every kind? If the cross is sufficient to transfer you from what you deserve, hell, to what you do not deserve, eternity with God, heaven, new heavens, new earth, the vision of Revelation 21 and 22, is the cross not strong enough to overcome real problems, real pain, real tri trial, real grievances. We're not, we're not saying these are nothing. We're not saying these are insubstantial historically or presently. We are saying that they do pale infinitely compared to the problem of divine wrath against sin. But we are in danger, I believe, of making the cessation of hostility between God and man almost a secondary thing and almost a small problem that was overcome. And the hostility between people groups of whatever kind, a big thing and something that the cross of Christ, that's what you're talking about, is almost insufficient for. And for whatever, whatever it's worth, whatever tiny little contribution we can try to make in a class like this, I want you to understand that at the very least, that is the reversal of the situation biblically. Biblically, the major problem, it's not, a, it's not a small and glancing thing, but the major problem is not the hostility between peoples. The major problem is the hostility between a perfectly holy, wrathful, just God and humanity. And, and what all Paul is really saying in Ephesians 2 in this passage is if God can solve the objective vertical problem, he can solve the objective horizontal problem.
Do you understand that? The, the second problem is objective as well. You get that? Once you lock in the objective nature of the atonement, boy, are you queued up to soar theologically in terms of your worldview. Because God objectively does not, will not, even, I think you can say, cannot hate you, unsave you, be hostile towards you as he will be hostile and is hostile to the unbeliever. It, it cannot happen because of Christ dying on your behalf to fulfill the decree of God, the electing purpose of God, the predestination of God. What a wonder of wonders. But everybody talks about that. Everybody reads about that. Now take objectivity from the vertical dimension and apply it horizontally. What if the same atonement that is objectively accomplished in terms of God and man it has objectively accomplished reconciliation between man and man, such that whatever existing grievances, trials, pain, real pain, right, real hostility has been a problem, a major problem in different societies and nations and among people groups now has, now has ceased. What if it has ceased? What if in the fellowship of the local church, all who claim Christ by faith, his blood washing their sin, do not approach one another any longer as if hostility reigns? What if hostility does not reign? What would it look like for you and me and all the people of God to not only talk about blood atonement and objective salvation and put that on Instagram, a neat quote from the Reformed tradition, yay. What if the church talked about objective blood atonement and its accomplishment between man and man? What effect would that have? What kind of witness and testimony would that be to the world? Not a blinding of the eyes to the past, to grievance, to pain, etc., but, but a much, 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 much greater recognition of what God has done in Christ to save us, but, but not only that, in saving us to bring peace, to bring peace. It's almost like it's too good to be true. That's a little bit of what Bauckham says at the end of his ethnic Gnosticism talk that I cited yesterday for in, in talking about the glory of forgiveness. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds almost ridiculous. It sounds almost simple. It doesn't sound complex. It, it doesn't sound like there, there's going to be a lot that we, um, a, a lot that we even lock horns about. It sounds like people who don't have anything in common in local churches come together and don't stereotype one another and, and don't think hostile things about one another when they meet people different from them, skin color, background, whatever it is, class. It sounds like, tell me what you think. You come into a local church and you have fellowship with Christians. And it sounds like in Ephesus, that is actually supposed to be the, the display of God's glory that dazzles Ephesus and lights it on fire and shocks people around the church because hostility does dominate outside the church. And our nature really isn't radical individualism. Our nature really is tribal, I think, in Adam because of Adam's fall. We're really tribal people, basically. I don't think if society collapsed, you'd have whatever, 8 billion individuals 
all sitting in their own cave, I think you'd probably have the formation of tribes. It's basically what happens, isn't it, after the fall? Humanity becomes tribal. And tribes, what? Define themselves against other tribes and hate one another, and division persists. Hostility and alienation. But what if God's, what if God's plan is not for us to engage worldly ideologies and philosophies and sort of use 40% of them? What if God's plan is honestly and kind of a breathtakingly simple, almost naive sense to build churches where people from different backgrounds come to faith in Jesus Christ who have nothing in common? Again, there may be hostility and pain between those different people groups that are represented by those individuals, but they come into the church and they don't bring their grievances with them. If someone sins against someone else, that's something that has to be dealt with in the church, of course. We're not washing that away. But we're saying background. We're saying past. Paul is saying to Jew and Gentile, you guys, you guys have ekthron, but it's actually been dealt with. And so don't bring it into church. So last comment here. What about those who do bring ekthron into church? What about those who do live in hostility? What about those who do surface grievances? We're not talking about having to work through things and handle different matters. We're not shutting all that down. We're a body. We bear one another's burdens. We, we listen. We're, we, we pursue humility. But what about, I, I ask the question nonetheless. What about those who bring ekthron into the church of, of any kind? What does that say about them? What is that going to do to the church's collective love of the objective accomplishment of Jesus Christ? What does it say if somebody says, yeah, 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 I believe in objective reconciliation between God and man, but that is effectively a small thing to me. Man and man, this is the big thing. Is that not to get the biblical trajectory completely wrong? That it is, it is beyond miraculous that God would reconcile himself to us. And that therefore, if God can reconcile himself to us, if heaven can come to earth, and God can love sinners like us, what does that say about hostility between man and man? I don't know about you, but when you frame the cross in these terms, at least for me, all of a sudden, I think a lot of things get clarified. And all of a sudden, it doesn't feel so naively pietistic, or however you want to frame that, to claim Christ as Savior and to say that our plan for engaging a divided, hostile world is to preach Christ. It actually feels pretty radical. It actually feels pretty unique. It actually feels ingenious on God's part. And it actually fills, maybe not you, me with tremendous hope. I can't sort out every issue in my context. I can't bring these things to resolution. I can't. How are we going to, even if somebody is pro-reparations, for example, how are we going to do this? How is this going to play out such that everything comes to objective? Isn't that what reparations is after as a concept? Objective cessation of, how is that going to happen? What about all the people who died? What about all the people who were enslaved? What about all the people who lived under Jim Crow? What about them? They don't get anything from reparations. Maybe their descendants do. Fine, I get that. But what about them? Where, how does this ultimately bring things to justice? The only ultimate objective justice we can find is through God. Justice is a fleeting thing in this world. 
It is not a common thing. You will have somebody cut you off on the freeway. You will have people mistreat you. You will have classmates here at school sin against you. You'll have church members in the pastorate defy you for no good reason. Numerous classmates of mine from Southern, from my MDiv, who entered the pastorate have gotten fired, and, and some of them not because they deserved it. This is in the church. There is little justice in this world. There's not a lot of justice. No one is saying we shouldn't pursue it. We should. Salt and light. But just remember that. There's not a lot of it. But there is justice in what God has done in His Son. And there is the cessation of hostility. And there is the hope of reconciliation. And if God can reconcile Himself to man, man can reconcile with man. And it is time, I would argue a little, little voice crying in the wind, it is time that the church lay hold of this. It is time that the church go to the Mount of Skulls, to the place of the skull. And it is time for the church to pick up a cross that has a crimson hue, that is stained, that the world does not esteem. And it is time for us to pick it up. And it is time for us to find our unity in it. And it is time for all of us, of whatever background, to carry our cross together all the way to glory. Because biblically, the place of the skull is the place of exaltation. Biblically, the death of Christ is the Narnian wardrobe to glory. It is the entry point to heaven itself. There, there is nothing better than the worst possible place, the place where our Lord, our Savior, was crucified. This is a cruciform faith. This is not an exalted faith. This is a lowly faith. And this is a faith that calls for death to self and cessation of hostility for all of us. Okay, that's what I have on wokeness. Uh, in sum, I will now take any last remaining questions uh, about what we covered yesterday or um, what we covered today. You may not have questions. We certainly have plenty to do in terms of technology. I know we had a bunch of questions yesterday. Jacob. Yeah, going back to yesterday, the, the four categories you gave us of the non-woke engaged and uh, committed. Um, so I know a couple churches, a couple people in ministry who are like probably 90% confused and maybe 10% engaged uh, just because they really don't think it's that much of an issue. But most of the resources they draw from are more towards the committed side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, with those types of churches and people, what do you think is the best way to explain how serious of an issue some of this is? Hmm. That's a good question, Jacob. I think I would say tr try to engage them with some of the uh, material that I quoted or that you can find online that is showing us um, just how angry and divisive wokeness is as a full-fledged ideology and how its strongest proponents really are creating a racist context. And so that's some of what I think we do. We show where systems go. We're careful there to say, it's, as you heard me say on record, it's not necessarily that everybody would say this who would hold to some form of this, but it is that these systems go somewhere. They don't stay stable. 
They don't stay in the middle. They're not actually soft. And they will, when they are full-fledged and come to full fruition, they will divide. And they will take captive. And so I would try to make clear that this isn't just what you heard me do in class and what I think I also said explicitly is I didn't really start in, in the middle, the unclear middle, where we're talking about justice. Well, like, like I, I mentioned, if everybody's just talking about justice, we're all going to get on board. But we have to understand that we're not just talking about justice in the same terms. Um, th that may sound fine, but actually there's a whole system at play here. And so my work trying to be a little bit Machen-esque is, is to say, this isn't just a few vague ideas that are more or less okay or even good. M what Machen did is he said, he, he said, this is a system. So I want all of you guys, all of you guys in this class should read Christianity and Liberalism by Machen if you have not. I repeat myself. All of you guys in this class should read J. Gresham Machen's Christianity and Liberalism, published in 1923. It's just about the most relevant book for our context right now, even though it's written 100 years ago. And what Machen does is he shows that there's people who are, who are talking about the brotherhood of man, the fatherhood of God, um, the gospel's effect in society, pretty similar language to today, were not just giving us these approximations of biblical ideas. There's actually a system behind that that some people buy into fully and are advancing, and a lot, of, a ton of people don't even really know exists. What Christian preachers and teachers do is we in not letting people be taken captive by ideologies, show that ideologies exist. So think about, for example, moral therapeutic deism. You guys have all heard of this. Think about how that has been defined in the last 10 years or so. It's really good that that got defined. Think about postmodernity, soft postmodernity, as I talked about yesterday. It's really good that that got defined. Because when it, once it gets the, once the ideology is identified, then you can oppose it biblically as you must. And I, I think as well about what Paul says in Second Corinthians ten. I think I read this to you a day or two ago in the class. But there's a two-sided reality to this this motif of captive. Um, just look with me once more at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, because this is the other side of the coin from Colossians 2, 8. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and what? Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? That as in Colossians 2.8, the Apostle Paul uses the language of captivity. My point here in playing this out is to say we identify ideologies and then what do we do? What does Paul say we do? We unleash war on them, not on flesh and blood, as if that is our primary foe. Satan is our foe. We're not waging war according to the flesh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. Paul's very clear on this, but he's also clear that he's still waging war. And the weapons of warfare are those that destroy strongholds, specifically destroy what? Arguments. Arguments. What are systems made of? What are ideologies composed of? Arguments. Lofty opinions. Raised against the knowledge of God. This isn't new. This isn't new. This is ancient, what we're doing. So what we have over here to the board for just a minute, 
What we have, and I would try to make this plain, Jacob, if I was talking to somebody. I, I really would. What we have is a B taken captive versus A take captive. Now I'll say this. Yeah, here's my eraser. Very exciting visual methods. If you have uh, class reviews for my class, please, please make sure to not miss just how exciting the teaching methods were that Dr. Strand brought to bear in his classroom. The whiteboard, how exciting. We have, we have this situation, I believe, if you bring together Colossians 2.8 and 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. We have a defensive situation, not just with wokeness, I mean, with every ungodly ideology, and we have an offensive situation, as in sports. You need to play defense and you need to play offense when it comes to worldview conflict, when it comes to theological engagement. Everyone does. Every Christian does, not just pastors. Every Christian needs to have this mentality, I believe. Because if you're bringing text together with text, which is all systematic theology really is, unto principles and conclusions, convictions, the worship of God, you have a be taken captive, Colossians 2.8, don't be taken captive, that is. <laughs> we need that, don't we? Don't be taken captive versus take every thought captive. That's offense and defense. Let's insert every. See, isn't that exciting to have visual methods like this that I add words to after leaving them out mistakenly? Don't be taken captive. So if you're preaching, guys, if you go to a church not long from now, one of the things I would encourage you to preach on as a sermon series is, is this sort of mentality. I would encourage you to work this into the church. This is not... This is not a fundamentalist perspective, okay, or, or something like that. This is not an arch-conservative perspective. This is just straight Bible. This is the Apostle Paul's ministry. This is what he did. This is what he gave a ton of attention to. He didn't want Christians to be taken captive. Ideology that is godless does not sit still. I've said that several times. It's not neutral. Unbelieving worldviews are not neutral. No one is neutral. Everyone has numerous ideologies and systems at any given time vying for them, playing upon them. They don't know that, lots of people. But that's the reality. When you're listening to, to the radio, when you're listening to podcasts, when you're watching TV, when you're watching movies, when you're having conversation with people, when you're reading books, you're being confronted in all sorts of ways with ideologies that would like to take you captive. Some of these are hard ideologies. Someone is talking to you about Foucaultian ideas, sexual postmodernism. A lot of it is soft ideology. You should not be taken captive by it. That's playing defense. But then that's not enough. That's not where we stop. We say, take every thought captive. This is what we're training people to do. Don't be taken captive. Spot the lie. Don't believe the ideology. Don't believe you're going to be happy if you blow up your marriage and leave this spouse who you have some conflict issues to sort out. If you get a new spouse, you're going to have new conflict issues to sort out. Don't believe that lie. But then, that's not enough. Take every thought captive to Christ. In other words, don't let an ungodly worldview in and do build a biblical worldview by studying scripture and thinking unto God as you feast on the truth. Don't let a godless ideology overtake you. Do pursue God. <laughs> pursue the knowledge of God. With all you're getting, get wisdom, Proverbs says. Get it. Get it, get it, get it. Take every thought captive. Don't stop until you die. I would say, friends, I would say men, that giving 
people this kind of framework is a major victory for many Christians. Do some of you remember when you started to read theology seriously? Do you remember when you started to understand that you weren't just vaguely a Christian, some of you, but you actually were being brought into something called the Christian worldview and a system of Christian doctrine? And then you started to, you started to realize, oh, wait, all, all Christian belief isn't the same, and everyone in the world doesn't believe the same thing. I think you can trace things back to the anti-wisdom of the serpent, as I made clear. But wow, does that take a lot of forms and a lot of manifestations in a fallen world. So that's some of what I would want to communicate. And, and if I communicate this framework, Jacob, then when I have the conversations over justice, I think people are at least... 40 yards down the field to starting to understand, oh, okay, just because someone tweets about justice doesn't mean they mean the same thing I do. And on and on it goes. Thank you. You're welcome. I got going a little bit there. Any other question? Uh, yes, Grace Church. Yes. Hey, Scott. Uh, I had a question about uh, you, you talked about racism yesterday and the redefinition of that term. I was just wondering your thoughts and opinions in the church uh, for using that word now with its redefinition uh, and uh, what you'd say, or if you'd only use the word partiality if you'd even think it wise to even say that word? Um, that's a very good question. And by the way, I did not realize you guys were in Kansas. I just want to go on record as saying I think that's very cool. I'm yeah, thankful. Yeah, we're in Grace Church of the Valley is in Kingsburg, California. Scott Artemis is the pastor. I'm just here for a week. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from Grace Bible Church in Hutchinson, Kansas, so I just thought it would be interesting. I love that. Okay, now I have come to a fuller... I've come to fuller knowledge. Thank you for clarifying for me. Uh, I'm very glad you're, you're, you're up the road just a bit. And that's a good question. I will still use the term racism. Um, I also work in, as you heard me do a number of times, ethnocentrism. Because even though there is such a phenomenon, I think, as racism, um, I also want to make, I also want to push people to understand that that's not all we can call it. I will use the term racism, but I, I am very cautious personally about systemic racism. So that would be where I would probably try to be careful about what I think you're getting at. Because, not because there can't be uh, corporate structures of racism. Uh, Egypt puts Israel in a condition of slavery in the Old Testament. Well, that's a comprehensive condition, isn't it? Uh, but because systemic racism today is not typically defined as um, that kind of circumstance, S systemic racism more typically means that sort of inherent white supremacy that is being transmitted voluntarily through actual racist words, but also involuntarily. So I would personally be very wary of the term systemic racism for the reason you just talked about. What I would probably do is define my terms wherever I could so that people would not mishear me. And I would feel free, as you picked up on, to use partiality, to use racism, ethnocentrism, um, and there may be other terms as well. But I would be trying to show that that point that I made yesterday, that racism isn't this unique, new American thing. Racism is partiality. And, and we have resources, and we have awareness of partiality in multiple places in the Bible, and it's strongly condemned. So I'm always, whatever term I use, 
I'm always trying to define it biblically and separate it from what is cultural. That would be, that would be really whatever, wherever we precisely land on these things, that's what I would push you to do. And I would urge strong caution with the term uh, systemic racism for the reason I mentioned. I'd be willing to have a good conversation about that. I'd be willing to say it can happen, that it, it gets into systems. It absolutely can. But I think what a lot of people mean by that is not what I am meaning by that. They're meaning that everybody, every, every white person is fomenting at every moment, is building up this massive force of white supremacy in America. And I, I reject that. And I will continue rejecting that. I believe that is actually racist. Uh, I want to go to Acts 17 briefly, just quickly, and then your break. I want to read Acts 17, 16 uh, to the end of the chapter, okay? Because I just want to give you a little bit more exegetical grounding in the argument I have been making against a reasonable Christian apologetic. It's not that we never try to show that Christianity has doctrines of love and justice and truth and these sorts of things that the human heart is seeking. We definitely should show those things and have those conversations. But I want to look at Paul's method here just quickly with you. Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange thing to, things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Okay, let's pause there briefly. We are often presented today uh, with the method that we should have co conversation and dialogue with unbelievers. And again, as you've heard me say in different forms already in the class, that dialogue aims at points of commonality. Now, it is interesting that Paul wants conversation, doesn't he? He's not hostile to unbelievers in the sense that he's closed to conversation. He's definitely not, and we should not be either. We should, we should joyfully seek out conversation with unbelievers, and we should be totally uh, uh, engaged in asking questions and listening to them and hearing why they hold the views they hold and all these sorts of things. But I simply want to note here and in, in, in the verses to come, what Paul is doing and what response he gets. Just note that, verse 18, these different philosophers are conversing with him. But what are they saying? They're calling him a babbler and a preacher of foreign divinities. What is Paul's method with these Stoics and Epicureans? Well, look at the end of verse 18. He preaches Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection. So what is he preaching, guys? He's preaching a distinctive Christianity. You understand the point? It's not like Epicureanism. It's not like Stoicism, at least ultimately. Now, I, you know, we're filling in the gaps here, of course, and we should always be careful about that. I, I, is he having a, an ongoing dialogue about, you know, the nature of happiness with the Epicureans or the nature of forbearance and perseverance with the Stoics. He may well be. Uh, we, have, we have room for understanding that at the very least. Oh, you believe in being Stoic. Well, in a form, I do too. But let me talk to you about Stoicism. <laughs> Stoicism is not your system plus Jesus. Stoicism is Jesus. J Jesus 
shows us, in other words, what true perseverance is in going all the way to the cross. And then what do they say about him preaching this Jesus? What is the, may we know what this new teaching is? Verse 19, this new teaching, it's not what they've heard. It's distinct. It's different than. It's not the same as unbelief. Verse 20, you bring some strange things to our ears, bro. Strange things. Christianity, when it is faithfully preached and proclaimed, is going to sound to many people strange. Even, mark this, in supposedly Christian contexts. Let's say the Bible Belt of America. Christianity is, true Christianity is going to sound strange. And it should sound strange. It is strange to the natural man. Now, Christianity actually brings us into reality, true reality. We stop believing fictions and delusions, as we talked about on Tuesday, like there's no such thing as manhood or womanhood. We say, no, what you see with your eyes is true. You're, you're walking into true reality as a, as a believer when you come to faith. We're not bringing you into madness. You're not walking off a cliff into irrationality. Kierkegaard could be misconstrued along those lines as one example. You're not giving up on reality. You've been living in unreality, and now you're walking into reality. You're embracing objective truth, the world God has made. So they wanted to understand these strange things that he brings. And then let's pick up with verse 22. All this lined out in terms of the what? Distinctiveness of the faith. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and human hands, being Lord, uh, sorry, sorry, verse 24, I skipped a verse. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served, verse 25, by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God everywhere overlooked, but now he commands all people to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he, the father that is, has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, verse 32, some, what? Mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with him. What do we see in this portion of Acts 17? Not what I would submit we often are told is in Acts 17, Typically, the focus is on verse 28, the quotation of Epimenides of Crete, probably the first quotation, and then Aratus's poem uh, in verse 28, second part. So Paul is using, you know, pagan voices, these sorts of things. So we have room then for all this engagement of culture. Well, I believe we can engage culture, but I don't believe that what Paul is doing is saying, see, I'm a reasonable Christian. I believe basically what you believe, but with a little Jesus citrus twist at the end of it. Actually, what Paul does in these verses that I just read is he rebukes the, his crowd in many senses. I perceive that you're very religious, verse 22. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. You think he's unknown, end of verse 23. I proclaim him to you. This I proclaim. Apologetics, evangelism, is really at base proclamation which is part of why it's so important to have biblical preaching. Biblical preaching is apologetics and evangelism in a sense, isn't it? 
It's proclamation. Yes, it's handling questions and engaging ideas, of course, but it's proclamation. And then he goes on to talk about the doctrine of creation. He gives a doctrine of God. He doesn't live in temples made by man. He's not served by human hands as though he needed anything. What is Paul doing there? Well, he's rebuking different philosophies, different theologies in talking about the true God, in proclaiming him. He made from one man, every nation of mankind. He's actually not far from each one of us. Verse 27, some Greeks, of course, would have believed in an absolutely transcendent God, a God who's far off and does not interact with his creation. That's not what Paul believes. Paul rebukes that form of unbelief in what he says. And then he does cite these different voices. So that makes sense to us. He's engaging that thinking. He's engaging his context, and he, he does comprehend it and understand it. But then what does he do in 29? Don't think that the divine being is like this. Do not think. He's, he's not like we think he is, he's saying. And then he calls the crowd to repentance. He brings in the doctrine of judgment, of divine wrath, a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And then he talks about the resurrection. Some mock him for what he says, verse 32. Others say, Let's, we'll hear you about this. And then some believe. So expect, by the way, when you preach and evangelize and do apologetics, when you're a living Christian uh, operating in the world God has made to be a witness, that some will mock you, some will give you a hearing and be intrigued, and some will believe. Expect that over the course of your ministry, certainly. So what I want you to see there very quickly, just a quick word, not unrelated to what we've been talking about with wokeness and neo-paganism, is I just want you to understand, going back to what I put on the board a minute ago, that, that it is right, it is right in fundamental terms, not just it is right, it is necessary to first drive unbelievers to understand the uniqueness and distinctness of Christianity. The uniqueness and distinctness of Christianity. And your job in ministry is not to present Christianity as a reasonable faith, by which I mean uh, palatable to the unbeliever. That is not your task. That is not what God has called you to do. That is not what Paul does in Acts 17. Sometimes arguments for different forms of reasonable Christianity are grounded in Acts 17. I just want you to understand that actually Paul is preaching, proclaiming by his own word, the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is evangelistic. The whole counsel of God is what makes disciples. It is what wins hearers over. It is the doctrine of creation. It is the doctrine of theology proper. It is the doctrine of uh, judgment. It is the doctrine of resurrection. He has all that and more just in that passage. You and I don't know what God is going to use to win people to Christ. We should never think this is the only doctrine that God will use to win unbelievers. We need to preach love. Because that alone shows the kind of God that people want. You have no idea what doctrine God will use to win somebody to himself. As you do not let people be taken captive as much as you can, Colossians 2.8, in your ministry, in your proclamation, in your evangelism, and then as you take every thought captive and train them to do that, you are showing the uniqueness and the distinctness and the beauty of Christianity. And you have no idea what doctrine within that whole counsel of God ministry the Lord will use to make disciples. Some people get saved through the doctrine of creation. Some people get saved by confronting the doctrine of sin. Some people get saved through the doctrine of judgment. Some people get saved through the doctrine of theology proper. Lots of people get saved through the doctrine of divine love. Absolutely. But there isn't one doctrine you preach, and you do not have weight on your shoulders to make Christianity like other systems. You actually have the first duty, I believe, to do what Paul does there and show how Christianity is separate from other systems. It has contact points with other systems. It it thrusts us into conversation with unbelievers happily. Man, let's, ha- let's throw down, baby. Let's talk. Let's hash this out. This is what you believe? But in that conversation, men, do not feel this 
pressure of a postmodern culture to soften your truth claims and your doctrine and to not talk about hell or women's uh, wives submitting to husbands or, or whatever it is, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ or blood atonement or whatever it is that unbelievers don't like. What unbelievers don't like may be exactly what wins them to the faith because it exposes their sin, their need for God. So don't be scared to show the uniqueness and distinctness and beauty of Christianity as distinct from other systems. In fact, do that. Do that with gusto.